Hello friends and welcome back to the Florida Railroad Museum. When's the last time you ever changed your suspension on your car? Probably about never. Can't say I've done it. But what's it like to change a locomotive suspension? Let's find out. Because our next project involves that bad boy right there. That is a leaf spring. And let me tell you what those are for. Well, first off, let's take a look at this thing. This is, effectively, a bunch of metal plates. And uh, you press down hard enough, it'll compress. But you're gonna need a lot of force to do that. Something like the force of the weight of this 250,000 pound CF7. Number 204 has some suspension issues, and that spring is going to get us back on the right track. Pun fully intended. Now, if you can tell, these are similar leaf springs. Two are on each of these Blomberg trucks. So quickly, I'm going to go a bit further in depth on how these leaf springs are made up. These leaf springs are actually a combination of eight sets of leaf springs. This is one unit on a Blomberg truck, but each one of these stacks of plates is a leaf spring. So there's one on the top, one on the bottom, and four pairs. So there's eight sets of leaf springs in this one unit. And there's also different components of this bracket here on the truck that allow the locomotive to go up and down and side to side as it goes down the track. Now, as I may have said, the leaf spring is responsible for the up and down motion of the locomotive body itself. So the chassis and the frame, not the truck or the axles. There's different components on this truck that allow each individual component to move separately. This leaf spring, if you'll notice, it's sitting in this long bracket on the top here. This bracket is actually connected to, and you could technically consider a part of, this frame. So this is solid with the locomotive frame. So if you jack the locomotive up, this piece will move and relieve pressure on the spring, but the truck will not move. It's independent from the Blomberg truck until you pull up on the kingpin in the center, but that takes a lot of distance to do that. There's individual coil springs on each axle to allow the wheels to go up and down in the truck, but that's independent from the leaf spring in the locomotive. And you'll see the leaf spring unit is sitting on this plate here where it curves down in front. This here is actually a long plate that extends all the way to the other side of this truck along the bottom and this will look identical on the other side because on the other end of this plate that protrudes on the other end is the second leaf spring unit and this bracket here that sits on this lip is what holds this plate or bar in place and keeps it at level and this what we're calling a swing hanger, it may have a different name, but that's what we've been calling it. This bracket here also holds the bar in place, but this is held into the truck by these pins up top, and this hanger is able to move inward and out like this. And that allows for the locomotive frame and the leaf spring and the suspension to have that side to side motion. So as the locomotive travels down the track and moves a bit side to side, this swing hanger is gradually swinging inward and outward, pulling this whole plate, both leaf springs and the locomotive frame with it, while the truck, independent of all those things, stays on a straight line on the two rails going down the main. And just as a side note, most native rail fans will know that the Blomberg truck is native to most of your general purpose locomotives you'll find on your average railroad, so your average GP40, GP38, GP10, like 8330, and here on the CF7204, the Blomberg trucks are very smooth riding and one of the best railroad bogies ever designed. Now, our problem child is the Blomberg truck on the rear of the locomotive here. 
Now the problem here with this one is, like I said before, these are effectively a bunch of metal plates that compress in a V pattern to create the up and down motion. Now, what happens when a lot of those metal plates shatter and a good number of them are missing? Well, I'll tell you what happens. The locomotive now sits much lower in the rear as opposed to the head end. And that can be a potentially dangerous issue if not addressed. That made it an urgent project to do and quite the interesting one because, like I said, I've never changed suspension before on anything and now we're doing it for a 200,000 pound piece of machinery. But because we have all these different components that allow for the axles, truck, and locomotive frame to move independently of one another, we have to jack things up in very specific ways to get certain parts to move, take tension off certain pieces, and well, let's jump into it and take a look at what we had to do. With the locomotive in the shop, the first step was to position two 35-ton jacks on either side of the chassis at the rear of the locomotive. Two by fours are inserted at the contact points, and these two jacks will have an ultimate lifting capacity of around 70 tons, or 140,000 pounds, which is just about the weight we'll be lifting here. That is because we're only lifting half of the locomotive, and the rest of the weight sits on the front Blomberg truck. As the jacks lift the chassis skyward, the pressure on both leaf springs is relieved as the brackets atop both leaf springs is connected to the chassis, so it lifts as well. However, the pressure relieved off the spring by lifting the chassis isn't quite enough to get the spring components out from the bracket between the support bar and the bracket itself, so we'd have to lift the support bar further by pulling the swing hanger out from beneath the support bar. This would allow the support bar to drop just far enough so that we could get the first components out. And now may be a fair time to advise as we bring the chain ratchet in that all the components of these leaf spring units that I talked about before are all freestanding. So each of the eight individual leaf springs and the two brackets on the ends that hold them in line are all freestanding and only held into the brackets by the weight of the locomotive on top of them. Now, there are indentations for the centers of the leaf springs to sit inside of on the support bar and the atop bracket, as well as studs to keep each leaf spring in line, but apart from those things, the locomotive's weight is the only thing that holds the leaf springs and their aligning brackets in place. So, the point I'm making here is that the spring is not going to be removed or reassembled in one piece. Each individual component must be placed in the proper location. Once we got this aligning bar pulled off, all of the leaf springs were able to be manually removed from the slot. And once that was done, we had to tend to another project that day, so this was postponed until the following day, where we can take a look at what the bracket looks like now that it is empty, and we can also see the leaf spring units that came out of the handicapped side. It's a good deal we're getting this done. As you can see, these are all the individual leaf springs that came out of that bracket and you can see that a lot more than just the one were starting to degrade crack apart right. there was also an incredible amount of dirt and grime that was caked onto the bottom of the support bar that we'd have to clean out before we put the new unit in Speaking of the new unit, all of the new components are now laid out ready to go in. This includes all of the eight new leaf springs as well as the two new aligning bars. The process of then installing all of these new components properly would be a long sought out game of tug of war. These components are all fairly heavy and are very awkwardly shaped. But before we could try any of that, we needed to drop the support bar lower so that we had more room to get all these components in and make it a little easier on ourselves. To accomplish this, we would remove the saddle bracket that holds the support bar up onto the truck and we placed jacks underneath so that when we slid this bracket off, the support bar would not fall all the way to the ground. But it would allow the support bar to drop just enough so that we had enough room to slide all of these components in somewhat comfortably. Now we just loosely install all of the components back in the proper orientations. Simply said, 
Not so simply done. It would take the three of us nearly another two hours to get the spring assembled and installed as there's quite a bit that goes into making sure each of these components is assembled in the proper orientation. The bottom half of the spring is effectively assembled upside down as the bottom four leaf springs must face upward to create the suspension motion with the downward facing top four leaf springs. In conjunction with the other four alternatively faced leaf springs, the aligning bars on each end of the spring keep the bars in line and keep the components from moving around. There's also a set of square indentations on the support bar that allow the centers of the leaf springs called the spring pivots to sit inside of. This also keeps the components from moving around once the weight has settled on the spring. We also must ensure that each leaf spring unit is pointed the right direction. The distance measurement from the center of a spring pivot to the end of the leaf spring is different on each side. So, if you have a leaf spring oriented backwards so that you have a shorter measurement paired with a longer measurement, the components won't line up properly. And on top of all this positioning, aligning, and measuring, we are still working in a very confined space with very heavy and awkwardly shaped components. So, this kind of job requires a lot of hand-eye coordination as well as verbal coordination with your co-workers to make sure that nothing goes wrong and everybody is on the same page. Because until the entire leaf spring unit is assembled and the weight of the locomotive has settled on top of it, locking it in place, one slip up in positioning can cause the entire assembly to fall apart and cause you to have to start all over again. That said, you also want to make sure that your hand is not in a position that if the assembly decides to fall apart, it might be in the path of one of the falling components because again, they are very heavy and will not be forgiving to fingers that might be in its way. Once the full spring unit is loosely assembled, it is ready to go under the locomotive's weight. That, there it is. Go yeah, in. Here's... Go in. Come on! Come on! But before we can do that, we must lift the support bar back up with the jacks underneath to allow the saddle bar to be reinstalled and for the swing hanger to swing back underneath the lip of the support bar so we can add two aligning plates. These two plates keep the swing hanger aligned with the edge of the support bar and the two plates allow for more lateral movement of the support bar within the saddle itself. While the plates may look crooked in this shot, the weight of the locomotive pressing down will cause them to align correctly. Once the two plates were in, we would just remove the support blocks, let down and remove the small jacks, and then let the weight of the locomotive press down on the spring. And with only a handful of retainer nuts left to tighten on the saddle bar, this meant job done for spring number one. Oh yeah, did I not mention we were actually going to replace both leaf springs on the rear Blomberg truck of 204, that we wouldn't do the other spring until next week as we wouldn't have time before this weekend's runs to complete the other side, and the other side wasn't nearly as damaged as this one. The only damages the other side accumulated were due to immense stresses caused by the instability of the spring we replaced today. As one can infer that the damages incurred on this side spring would cause increased stresses on the other spring due to the fact that the weight distribution in the rear was no longer even. So there you have it, a brand new leaf spring installed on the rear Blomberg truck of a 1950s CF7 diesel locomotive, and perhaps a brand new understanding of how locomotive suspension works on these older EMDs. I certainly walked away from this project with a lot more knowledge of this type of stuff than I ever had before. An initial glance at one of these Blomberg trucks and all of the pieces kind of tend to just blend together into this apparatus that just works, but every single component that is on these trucks has a purpose. And the result is an incredibly smooth riding railroad bogey that has earned its keep on decades worth of railroad equipment in the United States and beyond utilizing separate suspension for both the axles and the locomotive chassis and a support bar and swing hangers to allow for lateral movement. Coil springs embedded in the truck account for vertical motion of the axles within the truck and the leaf springs that we've just replaced one of account for the vertical motion of the chassis within the truck. Mechanical jargon aside, we were successfully halfway to rehabbing the entire rear truck of 204. Though, alas, the replacement of the second spring was postponed until the following Monday, as it was Friday by this point, and 204 would have to get back on the train to pull excited passengers for a train robbery this weekend. 
So we'll end the video here with 204 pulling out of the shop with her new spring installed. By the time I'm putting all this together, we have since replaced both springs and the ride difference in the locomotive is incredible. Anyhow, I thank you for watching this very unique project from the Florida Railroad Museum. I hope you learned a thing or two, like I did, and hopefully I'll see y'all around pretty soon on the Sunshine State Rails.